talk. So good afternoon, loyal members and friends of SAS. I am Sangin Lee, a third year medical student, and I am joined by my colleague Azar Adam Natker, a first year medical student, and together we lead the Stellenbosch University Surgical Society's academic portfolio. It is a great pleasure and honor to host our second SAS catch-up talk, Safari in Tiger Country, an approach to blunt and penetrating trauma um, tra penetrating injuries in the neck by Dr. Kirsten Bischoff. We are excited to be hosting over 100 medical students, both nationally and internationally. This includes medical students from several medical schools in South Africa, as well as Indonesia and Kenya. Before we proceed with the most exciting part of today's session, I would like to kindly remind everyone of the following ground rules. Click and please make sure that your microphone is muted upon arrival on the Microsoft Teams platform and please keep it that way. During the session, only the speaker and the academic portfolio leads will speak using their microphones. During the Q&A session, the questions submitted via the registration form will be prioritized. If there are questions based on the context of the talk, please use the chat function. These questions will be addressed should there be enough time. The recording of the catch-up talk will be made available afterwards via the SOS YouTube channel. Now for the most exciting part, I'd like to introduce our special guest today, Dr. Kirsten Bischoff. Dr. Kirsten Bischoff is a trauma surgeon and critical care specialist currently practicing at Netcare Christian Barnard Memorial Hospital and Life Vincent Palotti Hospital in Cape Town, Western Cape. She completed her MBBCH at the University of Witwatersrand, followed by a fellowship in general surgery. She obtained a master's in medicine from the University of Witwatersrand in 2016 for a study titled Factors Affecting Trauma Outcomes and Mortality, a comparison between an established level one trauma unit and a secondary hospital in South Africa, and consequently decided to pursue a subspecialty in trauma and critical care. She has worked extensively in the academic, public and private sectors and has been a consultant in the level one trauma unit at Charlotte Magnecke Johannesburg General Hospital. Chris Honey Barakwana's Hospital in Suatu at the Netcare Union Hospital in Johannesburg. She has an avid interest in teaching and continues to be an ATLS course director and DSTC instructor. Her core fields of interest are trauma systems, vascular trauma, and the ICU management of the geriatric trauma patient with multiple comorbidities. The virtual stage is all yours, Dr. Kirsten Bischoff. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for an opportunity to talk about something that I find very interesting. And uh, I'm hoping that you'll find it very interesting too. Um, an hour is a very brief period to, to actually fit in everything that we need to talk about here. So really what I've chosen for this talk is a couple of case examples that are very interesting, um, some anatomy to go through, and just the general approach to, to this kind of trauma. And, and hopefully by the end of it, you'll be as interested in neck trauma as I am. So many of you may be wondering why the talk is entitled Safari in Tiger Country. And that's really because the trauma neck is a very different animal to the kind of neck dissections that you're going to see in oncological surgery or in general surgery. Um, when a general surgeon takes a patient to theater, it's generally quite a controlled environment. They have time to position the patient appropriately. There's time to obtain an adequate airway. When a trauma surgeon has to take a patient to theater, it's a very different situation because of the anatomical structures of the neck. Um, and that's why this talk um, has been entitled a Safari in Tiger Country. And just to give you some idea, when you look at the neck, there are about eight different organ structures that traverse the neck. A number of significant vascular structures, nervous system, uh, the spinal cord, a number of musculoskeletal structures. And if you remember your anatomy, you'll understand that all of these structures are encased by very dense fascia. So any trauma to that area, any edema, results in significant amount of swelling and amount of hematoma that accumulates and distorts the anatomy quite significantly. Often when we have to access the neck as trauma surgeons, we're having to do it very quickly to obtain vascular control. And this makes it a very very difficult area uh, to, to operate in effectively 
if you don't know how to approach the type of injuries that we deal with. So I have a couple of questions to pose you and I want you to think about it. When I say to you trauma in the neck, what do you anatomically see as being part of the neck? Because for many people, when we use the term neck, they, they think of the area between the chin going down to the supraclavicular notch. And I'd like to challenge that preconception. And you'll see with a number of the cases that I'm going to illustrate to you as we go forwards, that the neck is far more extensive, particularly in the case of penetrating trauma, than you would normally think. Um, and if you think about it, the face all the way down into the chest is actually an extension of the neck. And for this reason, the management of neck trauma has to be extremely systematic um, in the way in which we approach it, because we have a very narrow window of opportunity to deal with these injuries before heading into a very fatal situation with the patients that we manage. So I think all of you will agree this is definitely trauma in the neck. But I'd like to know how many of you would have thought if we were describing trauma in their neck uh, to include this patient. Now, you may wonder what you're looking at at the moment. Um, and this is a patient who has had a gunshot wound to the subclavian artery. And many of you will say to me, but the subclavian artery, um, yeah, it's in the kind of the chest, kind of more the neck, maybe, maybe, which area? And the reason that this is important, and we're going to go through the way in which we anatomically label the neck, is that the subclavian artery is both a chest structure and a neck structure. And when a subclavian artery gets injured, it's actually quite a difficult thing to, to manage very quickly. And that's because the artery in itself is an elastic artery, and it's really like suturing paper when you try and put it back together. So as I said, what we're trying to challenge here is the idea of what you think of as trauma in the neck. What you're looking at here is a PTFE graph that I inserted in a patient with a gunshot wound um, in zone one that went through and basically shattered his subclavian artery and we had to put in a graft in order to repair that. So looking at the anatomy of the neck, we're not going to spend a lot of time going through anatomy. This isn't an anatomy class. But what this picture serves to illustrate is the neck is a very complex area. If someone sustains a gunshot wound to the abdomen, you may find that maybe two or three different organ systems are injured. It could be the bowel, it could be vasculature. You may find that uh, the bladder gets hurt. There may be a spinal cord injury. But in the neck, you've got a lot of structures very closely grouped together. And when one of them is injured, there is a high probability that one of the other structures will be injured as well. And that's why when we approach the neck, we have to really think quite carefully, what organs do I think have been injured and how do I approach this appropriately? So the anatomy of the neck, as I said, has at least eight, in it, and I think we're being um, underly generous in this situation. When I deal with patients with blunt force or penetrating trauma, most of the time there are two or three and sometimes more injuries that need to be addressed. Um, what we're going to start with when we go through the clinical approach is how we would start with the resuscitation of this patient. But we have to keep in our minds all the time, and this is something that I tell my registrars, it's something that I express to the students that I teach on the ATLS courses, is that the mechanism of the injury is always incredibly important. And in the back of your minds, when you're dealing with a trauma patient, you need to think, based on the mechanism, what is the potential for injury in these eight different organ systems? So many of you that have started your clinical time will be familiar with the ATLS way of assessing a patient. Trauma is very different from a lot of other areas in general surgery and that often when the patient arrives in the resuscitation bay, we don't have the luxury of obtaining a good history as to what actually took place. In many instances, a very unstable patient arrives, we don't know anything other than what the paramedics saw at the scene. Was it high velocity? Does this patient have other medical problems we need to consider? Has this patient got any allergies? So often when we're dealing with a trauma patient, we're really moving into the clinical examination portion before we even obtain an adequate history. The history tends to be found in retrospect. So what do I mean when I'm looking at this ATLS approach? Now, one of the questions that you asked in your question section was, how do you remain calm under pressure? What the ATLS approach has taught us as surgeons is that when we see a patient like this, the first thing you need to do is feel for your own pulse. 
before feeling for theirs. And what that really means is just slow down your own approach, slow down your own mindset and think about what you're actually dealing with. With the ATLS approach, this basically allows us to go back and think, okay, what is going to kill my patient immediately? What do I have to deal with right now to give myself time to think about all the other problems that are occurring? And what this means is that we approach the, the patient based on what is the most likely thing to kill that patient if we don't deal with it immediately. And we use what's called an ABCDE approach. So that basically uh, uh, drums down to airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. So for instance, if I don't control a threatened airway immediately, I've got about three to five minutes before that patient's brain becomes hypoxic and then it's game over and it doesn't really matter what the injury is. After the airway has been maintained, if I've checked the patient, I've said he's speaking to me, he's breathing okay, he's managing, then I move on to breathing. Does this patient potentially have attention pneumothorax? Does this patient have uh, a period where they're desaturating and I can't explain why? Is there a lung contusion? Is there a massive hemothorax? Is there something in the chest that I need to deal with right now because if I don't manage it right now, my patient is going to decompensate? Once that's dealt with, I can then move on to C. Now, there is a caveat to this situation. If a patient comes in and they've got blood splurting from a wound, you're not going to go and go, is his airway okay? Is his breathing okay? Before you actually obtain some degree of control over that bleeding. So if there's massive, obvious hemorrhage, you're going to put some pressure on that area before going through the A, B, C, D, E. But basically what this means is I deal with the problem that is going to most likely threaten my patient's life before moving on to the next thing. So circulation is very much part of the talk that we're giving today. Because of the density of vascular structures in the neck, the neck problem is often not just an A problem, but also a C problem. Um, it also becomes a D problem, D basically being the neurological examination. And as we've said, you've got a lot of neurologically dense areas, nerves, uh, the spinal cord in close proximity in your neck trauma patient. So this is something where you're dealing with an organ system where you've got a full house of potential problems that you've got to manage immediately. Once you move on from disability, and in this case, it's really just looking at whether the patient's GCS is fine, can they move all their limbs, are their pupils okay, is the spinal cord an issue and is that gonna cause problems for you? You then move on to exposure. Now, one of the things you will see is that when we take patients into a resuscitation bay, we take everything off. And that's because bullets like to bounce and knives like to hide. And as you'll see with one of the young women that I managed later on, these wounds can often be very difficult to find. And the rule in trauma is if I've got a bullet wound, I've got to find another bullet wound or I've got to find the bullet. And secondly, when there are stab wounds, I've got to look everywhere. The one young woman was a 17 year old who had about 20 different stab wounds to the neck. And the one that caused the most damage was actually in her hairline at the base of her skull. And if we hadn't shaved back the hair, we would have missed the puncture wound that was responsible for most of her pathology. So exposure is extremely important. The secondary survey is something we do when we've dealt with all the life threatening situations. And we go back and we do a head to toe examination and we decide is there anything else that I've missed that could be a potential pitfall in this patient? And then you may hear us using the term tertiary survey. And tertiary survey basically goes back to the idea that you never examine a patient only once, and definitely not in trauma, because these patients change clinical condition, and you need to continuously go back, reassess, and even repeat your primary survey to look for things that you might have missed the first time around. So, when I, as a trauma surgeon, communicate with other doctors and there are patients that they want to send me or with the paramedics, we need to have a language that we can utilize so that we're all on the same page. And the reason for this is that in trauma, there is a lot of preparation that is necessary to make sure that you give the best to your patient. So if a paramedic or a doctor phones me, I already want to start be prepared to get the theater ready, get the blood bank on board, get hold of um, my anesthetist and tell them, look, we're going to need to be in theater within the next 10, 15 minutes, get, rid of, get ICU and tell them that uh, we're going to need a ventilator for this patient. And that's why when we talk about 
neck trauma, we divide it into anatomical zones. And these are quite simple. If you look at this picture over here, zone one in the neck is from the uh, suprasternal notch and the clavicles extending up to the cricoid cartilage. And if you go back to your anatomy, you know that there is a lot of stuff happening in the neck. So if you've got an injury in zone one, a bullet wound, a stab wound, or blunt force trauma in that area, you know that potentially your subclavian arteries could be hurt, the internal jugular vein, your vagus nerve. You know that the apices of your lung extend above the clavicle, so there's the potential for an associated chest injury. And because of the close proximity of zone one to the chest, Often when I'm dealing with a zone one neck injury, I'm also potentially going to end up operating in the chest in order to get control of some of the structures that are in the neck. So our biggest problem with controlling vascular trauma in zone one is that often this will require a stenotomy uh, to get proximal control of these lesions. Zone two extends from the cricoid cartilage to the angle of the mandible. And this is an area, again, with a lot of anatomical density. You have your carotids, your internal jugular, you've got uh, spinal accessory nerves, vagus, sympathetic chains, esophagus, um, pharynx, just to name a few things. So you can understand, again, that there are a lot of organs that can be injured uh, in a very small anatomical space. Zone three becomes extremely difficult because of the very narrow anatomical area, and it extends from the angle of the mandible going to the mastoid or the base of the skull. Um, and the problem with this is that when we have to control the vessels in this area, there's not a lot of space to work. So getting distal control of these injuries can sometimes be quite a challenge. And as you'll see as we go through this talk, we often would like to get a little bit more information by getting some degree of imaging before diving into the surgical options. So I thought I'd give you a couple of the cases that we've dealt with so that you can understand some of the challenges that we deal with. So this gentleman was a patient I operated on late last year. Um, he was a healthy 42-year-old male. And yes, he was a blunt force patient, but unfortunately the injury that caused the most trouble in him was actually of a penetrating nature. He was going down a hill at speed and a taxi pulled in front of him and he went through the rear glass window of the taxi and sustained about a 10 centimeter laceration to the supraclavicular region. So that, that's the area just above the clavicle where his subclavian vessels were sitting. And initially in the resuscitation bay, he came in stable. He required a chest drain placement for a hemonumothorax. He was lucky in that there wasn't a lot of trauma to his face, but he had a large wound that started to actively bleed in the resuscitation bay and had to be taken to theater for control of the subclavian artery. Um, in the end, what this gentleman sustained is that he'd actually taken off the thyrocervical branch of his subclavian. Um, that had to be controlled. And he was actually very lucky because the wound just missed the second part of the subclavian artery. And had that occurred, he may not have made it to hospital in the first place. Now, often what you might see us doing in the resuscitation bay, um, which you might find a little bit strange, this is a Foley's catheter. So... What we've got here is a gentleman who sustained a zone one stamp wound to the right supraclavicular fossa and was actually bleeding actively. Now, as you know, trying to stick your finger in there might be potentially dangerous and you might cause a lot of damage. You can try it, but you're probably not going to get to the vessels that you need to control. So what we did in this patient was we put a Foley's catheter into that area, inflated the balloon. And now the balloon that is sitting on that wound is actually acting just like a finger, putting pressure on the subclavian artery and stopping the, the bleeding. What is important is that you must actually tie off the balloon at the back because if you don't, you're going to have blood flying into your face before you get the patient into the operating theater. But these are some of the tricks that we use when trying to control trauma patients because it allows us a little bit of time to then control the patient's blood pressure, get them into the operating theater, and then position him effectively for the kind of surgery we need to do. So again, just to give you a view of the anatomical areas, you can see um, in this particular picture that we have the platysma. Now the platysma is muscle, but it's also more fascia. And one of the criteria we look at as to whether to be concerned about trauma in the neck is whether or not in the case of penetrating trauma, the platysma muscle has been penetrated. And if that missile, that bullet wound, that umbrella spoke, that bicycle spoke, and we see all sorts of creative ways of uh, 
patients inflicting trauma has gone through that muscle, there's a greater possibility that some of these structures are going to be injured in the neck. So this is Miss IB, um, and she was a very unfortunate young woman on a farm that was about two hours outside of Cape Town. And she was actually with a friend and they were just putting away some plates after doing the washing up. And they had a little bit of an altercation and one of the friends took the plate and just smashed it onto the ground and a piece of the glass unfortunately went into the patient's neck. Now, trying to illustrate to you how important airway is when dealing with neck pathology. As you can see in this young woman, we've again placed a Foley's catheter. This was actually placed by a GP in a small town near to where the patient was hurt. She was flown in by helicopter. And because he placed this, it controlled some of the bleeding, um, allowing time for her to get to the hospital. But what I want to bring your attention to is a large amount of hematoma that is forming around the neck here. Now, if you imagine when you put on a pair of stockings or pants, there's only so much space in that pant leg uh, for anything else. And the neck is very much like a pair of stockings. If you try and put more into it, you're actually going to find that not very much wants to fit. Now imagine that your airway is sitting just here and this big hematoma that is expanding and expanding and expanding is actually going to be starting to put pressure on that airway and distort the anatomy. So often in these circumstances, when we are worried about the airway in a trauma patient in the neck, we don't use muscle relaxants, we use an awake intubation and we use a bronchoscope so that we can actively identify the airway. And that is because if you take this patient's ability to keep her own airway open away, you'll find yourself losing your patient because you effectively cannot intubate and ventilate her. So once we took this lady to theater, um, she was actually quite unfortunate because the piece of glass had not only completely transected her internal jugular vein, which you can't see here because it's, it's been repaired and retracted, but it also went straight through the vagus nerve on that side. And this is a completely transected vagus nerve. And it went into the carotid sheath and luckily did not lacerate her carotid artery, but could have gotten a lot more damage. Um, and she was quite hemodynamically unstable when she got to us. Um, she subsequently has made a full recovery. This is the incision that was made. Um, and uh, a full repair was done of both the vagus nerve by myself, as well as the vessels and she went back to her horse ride, riding on her farm. Um, quite an unfortunate situation. The next patient is one of the things that we see in South Africa more frequently than we would like. Um, she was a housekeeper that was working for a family in a home robbery. And the assailants actually slit her throat and not only went through both sternocleidomastoids, but opened up her pharynx so that when the paramedics were on the scene, they could actually see the back of the pharynx. And in order to maintain her airway, they intubated her through the injury. And I'll show you a picture of that shortly. Um, and this highlights again, the fact that the airway becomes quite an important thing to consider when looking at neck trauma. One of the first things you need to decide when you have a patient with neck trauma is even if the airway is not a threat right now, is this a patient who potentially is going to have a threatened airway in a minute, in an hour's time? And will I not be doing this patient a favor by obtaining a safe airway before with proceeding with any of the other things that I need to do. So what you're looking at here is a picture of a laceration straight through the trachea and you can see the rings at the back and that was caused by a, a knife wound to the neck. Um, and often what we do with these patients is if we were to try and intubate them from the top, we might actually find that we open up the wound even worse and we might lose the airway. So in some circumstances, even in the emergency setting, we might actually intubate the patient through the hole in the uh, missile tract. This is a picture of the young woman that we spoke of earlier, the 35 year old who had her neck um, slit. What happened here is that the anaesthetist has uh, subsequently advanced an airway in while we do the tracheostomy. And once the tracheostomy has been done, we then repaired the pharynx. She was very lucky in that the muscles of the sternocleidomastoid prevented uh, lacerations to, this, to the arteries on both sides. So the carotids and the internal jugulars were intact. 
The next example is Misty, and I, it always amazes me how many of our tourists still like to go up to the Boer Carp area, because unfortunately this is a young French student who was studying in Cape Town, who went for a walk in the Boer Carp area and sustained about 12 different stab wounds to not only zone one, but zone two and zone three of her neck. Uh, the platysma was traversed. And in fact, in this patient, the wound that caused the most damage was in her hairline at the base of her skull. And it actually went um, through into the spinal canal with actually just missing her spinal cord. So she was lucky in that the spine itself was not hurt, but one of the nerve roots was lacerated. Um, and the main thing that she complained of was just this burning pain over the tip of her scapula relating to the nerve root distribution of where the laceration occurred. Um, the dysphagia was investigated and that was just discomfort that she was having because of the lacerations and she was very lucky both her pharynx and esophagus were actually okay and uh, with the help of physiotherapy and the intervention of a neurosurgeon she made a full recovery. So just to remind you again looking and particularly in the case of this young woman a wound that comes from the back of the neck has much potential for injury as a wound that comes from the front. And people often forget that in posterior triangle injuries, so the things that occur behind the sternocleidomastoid, that you have the spinal canal sitting here and that the vasculature itself extends quite posteriorly into the back of the neck. And as you can see, there are a number of nerve structures, the vagus, the hypoglossal, um, the spinal accessory nerve with the potential for injury in these patients. So you need to be very cognizant of the fact that you're dealing with a very organ dense system. The final patient that I'm giving you as an example um, challenges that preconception that all head injuries are just head injuries. This gentleman was a 67 year old American businessman walking around in the center of Cape Town. He was on his way back to the CTICC where he had a conference. And uh, an assailant just walked up to him and literally stabbed him in the cheek. It went through the zygomatic bone. Um, he arrived in casualty, and the casualty doctor initially stitched up the wound on his cheek, and he just assumed that the trauma was fine and there was nothing else they needed to be worried about. And what really just concerned the casualty officer was the fact that this patient's pulse rate remained persistently low at between 40 to 45 beats. Despite the fact that this gentleman is not on a beta blocker, he's had no previous cardiac history, he's not on any other medication whatsoever. So the physician came in and saw this patient, and what concerned the physician was the fact that because the man had been assaulted, he was worried maybe it was a head injury that was causing this problem. As, as you know, head injuries can result in hypertension and bradycardia. Um, and at this point, the physician was the one that actually contacted me and said, look, I've got this gentleman. I've been called because his pulse rate's low, but I actually think this might be a trauma patient. And I was immediately concerned because when I interviewed the man whose GCS was 15 out of 15, the one thing he kept telling me was my throat is sore. I'm struggling to swallow and my throat is sore. And the problem with this patient was that the wound that he had in his cheek had actually extended down into his pharynx, he had a parapharyngeal hematoma and it had lacerated the internal carotid artery just near the carotid canal. He had a false aneurysm sitting there and um, also had a laceration of the maxillary branch of his external carotid artery. Um, and I ended up intubating this patient because his airway was threatened. And we sent him uh, to neurosurgery who then placed flow diverters to help because in this case, doing a neck expiration would be a problem because the carotid artery was injured right at the base of the skull. And the neurosurgeon had to assist with the vasculature in this area and place flow diverters in that would allow us to maintain perfusion to his brain without us actually having to go in and explore that carotid region itself. So how do we approach the decision when we have a patient who's got trauma in the neck? Now, it's fairly straightforward when we've got someone who's unstable and they're bleeding and their blood pressure is stable, uh, unstable. You know that this patient is going to need to go into the operating theater. The patients that become slightly more tricky are those that are either uh, completely asymptomatic but have had a history of trauma uh, or those that are completely stable, but you're not really sure in that organ dense area 
what's actually been hurt. And so what we do, and this applies to blunt force trauma and not just penetrating trauma, is that we break them up into the stable and the unstable. So unstable means they go to the operating theater. The stable patient who is symptomatic, so symptomatic being is this patient complaining of dysphagia or dynophagia, so difficulty swallowing or pain on swallowing, then we need to investigate. Is this patient complaining of difficulty breathing? Is this patient complaining of having bled a lot at the scene, but now the bleeding has stopped? Now, what kind of investigations might we utilize to help us to decide what we need to do for this patient? And again, we look at the zones because the zones of the neck tell us potentially what organs we need to be worried about. Now, we used to do formal angiograms on almost everybody, but that was before the advent of the CT angiogram. And we now usually use CT angiogram as the main way of investigating these patients because it gives us the right amount of information. Um, it's a lot easier and less invasive than a formal angiogram. And it also tells us about some of the other structures. So when I do the CT scan, I'm not only looking at the vessels, I'm also able to see the proximity of the missile tract to the, the airway, to the uh, esophagus, um, and also the proximity to other nervous system structures that I might be concerned about. The same thing applies to the asymptomatic patient. So life-threatening airways, the thing we would be we're concerned about would be airway obstruction. As we highlighted in that young woman, you could see the hematoma was expanding. If that hematoma had gotten any bigger, it would be putting pressure on her airway. And if they hadn't got her to hospital soon enough, we may have potentially lost the patient because of a failure to intubate. Bleeding is an obvious one, as we've highlighted, because of injuries to the internal jugular, to the carotid vessels, the subclavians. And as I said to you before, don't think of neck injuries as being just neck injuries. Often neck injuries involve the head and they also involve the chest. So a patient with a zone one neck injury could sustain a tension pneumothorax because of penetration of the pleura as it extends above the clavicles. Now, one of the things that we deal with in blunt force trauma that can be very dangerous is um, the entimal flap. So the entima is the layer that lines the inner part of the vessel, the layer that's in contact with the blood. In blunt force injuries, these can be a lot more difficult to pick up. And often one of the things we look at in blood force trauma, so to give you the example of a patient in a car accident, would be the seatbelt sign. So a, a bruising along the neck might tell us that there's something injured in the vasculature in that neck that we need to be aware of. What happens with an entimal flap is that they start to form a thrombus in that area. The thrombus then obstructs the vasculature and then that patient ends up stroking out it can be several hours to even several weeks to even sometimes several months after the initial injury. So we need to keep that in mind. Sepsis becomes a problem when the esophagus has been injured and it's missed. And that's because the, the fascial layers around that area extend all the way down, not only in the neck, but down into the chest. And if you're not aware of this, these patients can develop life-threatening sepsis. Um, and that needs to be dealt with quite immediately. When we look at vascular and uh, airway and esophageal injuries, we talk about hard and soft signs. So it's quite, it's quite simple. Hard signs are things that are obvious. If a vessel is splurting blood, that would be a hard sign. An expanding hematoma would be a hard sign. Someone with strider would be a hard sign. A patient who has um, a, diff a just diffuse surgical emphysema. So when you push on the skin, you can actually feel the air just under the skin surface, that would be a hard sign. Some of the softer signs, and these are things that are not particularly obvious, but they tell you you need to be aware that this patient has the potential for injury would be something like dysphagia or dynophagia, changes in the quality of the voice. And the young horse riding lady, the one that had the neck exploration, she had a very, very hoarse voice when she initially came in. And that's how we partly knew that there was definitely either an airway or a neurological insult. Um, and we know that now because of the vagus nerve that was injured. Hemoptysis would be another soft sign. And then a widened mediastine in which you may pick up on the initial chest x-ray done in the resuscitation bay. So the approach, as I said, would be stable, unstable. Unstable goes to theater. This patient who's stable, we've got some time to investigate. Some of the investigations that we might utilize in these patients would include things like the CT angiogram. It would include things like a contrast swallow, or it would include endoscopy. 
So my team knows that the CT scanner is what we call the donut of death. So the only time a patient goes into a CT scanner is when they're completely stable. And why do we use CT scans? Because CT scans give a lot of information. They tell us about whether or not the missile has penetrated in a way in proximity to the structures that we're concerned about. Um, they can be utilized to give us information about the vasculature. And they can also tell us whether or not the missile is still in the body, which is also very helpful. Often we have patients where a bullet wound may enter the neck, but may end up in the abdomen. So we need to think about the investigations we're going to use as adjuncts to help us to decide how we need to further help these patients. And the reasons we use CTA is that it's less invasive than an angiogram. It gives us all the information that we need. It can be done fairly quickly because in most of our resuscitation bays, our CT scanners are situated quite close uh, to the resuscitation area. This is an example of a patient with a pseudoaneurysm that's coming off just near the base of the uh, common carotid artery before it bifurcates into the external and internal carotid. And this patient was completely hemodynamically stable. They had a gunshot wound that went in to the anterior triangle. Uh, the bullet exited the back of the neck and we imaged them because of the proximity of the injury and this is what we picked up. We can sometimes use duplex ultrasound to image these patients and in experienced hands, it can give us a lot of information. However, there are some limitations uh, to duplex and that's why we often utilize CTA more than we use duplex ultrasound. However, this can be in helpful in, for example, the ICU setting where a patient's intubated and it may be more difficult to get them into the CT scanner. But ultrasound is quite difficult to use to image your zone one and your zone threes. So again, your CTA has a far more bigger way, range of utility. What do we do with those patients that, for instance, have a bullet that's sitting or fragments of bullet very close in the neck? And, and then you see lots of scatters of uh, light going around it that uh, prevents you from actually seeing the injury. In those situations, we may still take our patients for a formal angiogram. So a gentleman with a gunshot wound where the bullet is sitting near one of the uh, transverse processes of the spine and causing scatter, we might do a formal angiogram because it allows us to block out the bullet fragments and still see whether the vessels themselves are significantly injured. The esophagus is a very dangerous thing that we need to manage um, as quickly as possible because if we don't deal with the esophagus sooner or later, we're going to end up with quite a few steps that this woman is going down into the chest. Um, this is a picture of a patient who had a normal x-ray done after a soluble contrast study. And here you can actually see the contrast going down into the ch chest from the thoracic esophagus. Um, and this patient developed significant mediast mediastinitis that had to be dealt with. This is a scope um, showing a stab wound that had penetrated through into the esophagus, and this patient required an open repair. And this is just a picture of the airway. So if we're not sure if a main stem bronchus or a larynx or something else is injured, we may actually do laryngoscopy and bronchoscopy on the table to see whether those structures have been injured as well. How do we manage it? Again, the main emphasis being on managing the airway controlling it in a way that prevents us from losing it because it is the main thing that if we lose the airway, we've lost the patient. Um, and as I mentioned, some of the things we might utilize would be to actually intubate the patient through the wound itself. When we do our vascular repairs, we have a number of options. Sometimes we, have to, we can completely tie off the vessel and in some of the bigger veins, this is what we do. We try and avoid a longitudinal repair because it narrows the vessels. Sometimes we use vein patches, sometimes we use PTFE grafts, and sometimes we use native vein to do the repairs. In some circumstances, we can get the radiologists to assist us, and we actually stent the lesions without actually having to do a full surgical exploration. And in some venous injuries, we might not have to do anything at all because the veins stop bleeding. And if the patients remain stable, we just monitor them non-operatively. Um, and only if they start to bleed again do we actually go and do a surgical exploration. These are just pictures and we're not going to go into detail because it's far beyond uh, the scope of this talk. But these are some of the things that we can do to repair esophageal injuries and they are every, everything from a pericardial flap to using a piece of intercostal muscle to a primary repair. 
So just in conclusion, and I hope this wasn't too, too boring for any of you, um, I always tell my students that uh, good judgment comes from experience and uh, experience comes from poor judgment. And as you'll see from the pictures that we looked at, um, medical illustrators are very optimistic about what we're actually dealing with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bischoff, um, for the enriching talk. I'm sure that we can all agree that today's catch-up talk um, has greatly contributed to our personal and professional development as future doctors and hopefully for some, as, some of us as future trauma surgeons. Um, now we are going to move on to the Q&A segment. So I'm going to share my screen with the questions. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? I'm not seeing any of the questions yet. So maybe if you. Um, I think okay, so. Now, yes. yes, now I can see it. I see something now. Can you see the screen? I can see the screen. So if you want to move on to the first question, then I'll be able to see the first question. Okay. So, question one. Um, so question one is, um, let me just get there. Um, when did you know that you wanted to pursue surgery? So um, I was 14 years old when I bought my first copy of Gray's Anatomy in the original Latin and started translating it. And uh, I was 14 when I decided already that I was going to be doing surgery. So it was before I even got into medical school, I'd already decided uh, that this was the course that I was going to take. So um, I was very determined. That's wonderful. I think you are the, um, uh, you, you definitely knew exactly um, where you'd shine and um, I'm sure your career is very evident to that. So that's quite wonderful. Um, question two is, um, I know you alluded it to a bit um, in the talk, but the question is, how does one stay calm and focused in emergency situations? You know, this kind of, you'd be amazed what people are able to do when faced with challenges. Um, and often you'll find that doctors have a lot more within themselves than they actually know. When faced with a situation where someone is actually really struggling, and you are the only person who can make a difference. You often find a tremendous amount of calm in yourself uh, that you didn't realize you actually had. And one of the things that I always say to the registrars and to the interns uh, that I've taught over the years is before you start taking the patient's pulse, check your own. And what that really means is take a minute. Rushing into a situation and being nervous and being anxious is not gonna help you and is not gonna help the patient. You need to take a minute to take a breath, to remind yourself that you have the ability to deal with this, that you have the training that you need to deal with this. And one of the other things I always say to them is remember the blood on the floor is not yours. So you just take a minute and you look at the learning in that that you've acquired over a number of years, you calm yourself down and you go back to the basics. The reason we structured the advanced trauma life support system was because when any of us get nervous or anxious, and even some of the most experienced surgeons get challenged by some very scary things. Um, my youngest gunshot patient was a three month old baby who sustained chest and abdominal trauma. And I challenge anybody to see a three month old gunshot victim and not feel a little bit shaken. But what you do is you go back to the basics. What do I need to do for that patient? You calm yourself down, you take a deep breath, and you go airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure. What does this patient have that is a problem? And what do I need to do to fix it? And as long as you keep going through that mantra, you find that over the years, you, it becomes almost the norm to calm yourself down, take a minute, and then step into the situation. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful answer. And I think something that we'll remember is you know, the blood on the floor is not yours. Um, that really does put things into perspective. Thank you so much. The next question 
So the next question is, um, how important is rehabilitation for these patients? And do you work closely with physiotherapists in managing these patients? So rehabilitation is essential in trauma patients. Um, and one of the things you realize when you work in the private sector in particular, is that you have to take these patients from resuscitation bay all the way to full rehabilitation. And, and my physiotherapists, we know each other on a first name basis. So Aisha and Heidi know the minute one of my former patients comes into the resuscitation bay and ends up in ICU, they're already there the next day doing what they need to do. Um, I work very much in tandem with um, occupational therapists, with speech therapists and with physiotherapists. And we're really part of an, an entire team that gets that patient to the point where eventually they go back to doing what they would do every day. So we have to remember that trauma is what we call a team sport. Whilst we're surgeons and we love the excitement and the energy that comes with the operations that we do, there are several other people that are exceptionally talented in terms of getting that patient out of hospital and back to function. So rehab is a very big part um, of what I do in, in my daily practice, and I rely on people to do that. Thank you so much. Um, you've definitely highlighted the importance of a multidisciplinary approach to the patient care. Um, and yeah, I think it's so important for us as future healthcare professionals to take heed of that. So thank you so much. Um, the next question is, what inspired you to sub-specialize in trauma surgery? So when I was working through my surgical rotations, <clears throat> I started to realize that um, I found a lot of calm in chaos. So the more chaotic the situation, the calmer I became. Um, and I realized that I enjoyed trauma surgery because I never knew what was going to come through the door. And I'd always known that I wanted to operate in all parts of the body, uh, except for the brain. I've never wanted to be a neurosurgeon ever in my whole life. Um, and I don't really care for fractured bones and, and that so much. That That is to my orthopedic colleagues. But I wanted to be able to operate in the chest. I wanted to be able to do vascular repairs. I wanted to operate in the abdomen and the pelvis. Um, I, in particular, enjoy vascular surgery, um, but I don't like vascular pathology. So a lot of the critical limb ischemias and um, vascular pathology that we see in normal vascular surgery isn't that pleasant. Whereas the kind of vascular pathology we see in trauma is fresh, nice, healthy blood vessels to be repaired. So for me, trauma surgery was a way of being constantly challenged and knowing that one day I might be doing a lobectomy, the next day I might be repairing the carotid artery, and on another day I might be doing a bowel anastomosis. And it constantly challenges me as a surgeon and makes sure that I keep up to date with all areas of general surgery as well. Thank you so much. I think you've really highlighted the importance of um, finding what you are passionate about, because if you are passionate about it, as they always say, um, then um, it doesn't feel like work, but it rather feels like following one's passion. And I think that's very important. Um, the next question is, could you explain the relationship between acute initial management of airway, bleeding, and C-spine protection? How does one attempt to control bleeding and open the airway while also protecting the C-spine? Also, what kind of damage to blood vessels would direct blunt force to the anterior neck? Good do. Does this damage pose neurological risk? So I think that the person that was asking this question wanted to cover all aspects of neck trauma in one particular question all at the same time. But it is a very good question. Um, what do you do, for example, in a, and I'm going to use the example of a gunshot wound that passes through both sides of the neck. So now you've got a patient who potentially has a spinal injury. You can't exclude it. A vascular injury, definitely, who may be unstable, and someone who you've got to position adequately um, in order to both intubate and potentially operate on. So this is where ATLS goes in again. 
remember that you protect your cervical spine at all costs until you can either clear it clinically or be, until you have imaging that can clear that spine. So even in the case of, this pa of these patients, you have to keep that C-spine stable until you can exclude a cervical spine injury. You cannot move that neck around. So as you've seen in some of the resuscitation bays that I'm sure some of you have been in during your clinical rotations, someone is always holding or supporting the cervical spine. And I always tell my students, remember that C-spine is airway. It's part of A. Controlling the C-spine and checking the airway are part of the same thing. You've got to train yourself to think, when I go to check the airway, one of the first things I do is what we call the resuscitation salute, and I go, hello, sir, how are you? And I protect the C-spine at the same time. And there are ways for us to intubate a patient or to keep the airway open while still protecting uh, the cervical spine. So for example, if you need to open the airway, you might do a jaw thrust to start with, and that's not gonna threaten the airway. You're not gonna be flexing the neck um, forwards and you're not gonna be overextending it, but you can still have someone holding the airway. If you need to intubate that patient, you'll often get your partner to hold the airway from the front of the patient instead of standing above at the head of the bed. And, and I'm sure you've seen these examples in your clinical rotation. There have been circumstances in which I take a patient to theater, the anesthetist will use a bronchoscope to intubate the patient while the patient is still in head blocks protecting the cervical spine. And I will actually operate on the vessels with the neck in a less than ideal position. Um, because usually when we operate on the neck, we'd put a bolster behind the shoulders and we'd actually extend the neck and turn it around. But in, in the case of a patient where the spine might be injured, we have to keep the spine still and still operate in a much narrower area. So at all times, until you can clinically clear the C-spine or clear it with imaging, you have to protect the spine. Now, from the point of view of what kind of vasculature injury you get, I think one of the things that I highlighted was with blunt force trauma, it becomes far more difficult to know whether a vessel's injured because all you may have is some bruising around the neck. And the typical picture would be one of a seat of a seatbelt injury or a patient who's attempted to hang themselves, where you may have this bruising around the neck and the carotids being right in that area can have some shearing either on the vertebrae themselves or um, on the ligature or on the seat belt. And what happens in that circumstance is that the entimer, the inner layer of that blood vessel, separates. And because the blood vessel is damaged, a clot then forms and that clot then propagates. And it either embolizes to somewhere else or it blocks the blood vessel and that results in ischemia. Another area where we see this kind of problem would be in knee dislocations and elbow dislocations. And again, the vessels can be sheared on those bony surfaces and the patient may be completely stable. You may still be able to feel a pulse and you may not be aware that there's an injury. And that's why in trauma, we talk about the concept of a proximity injury. And that means if, for example, I know my patient had a knee dislocation and I know that the popliteal vessel is sitting behind the knee, I know that there's potential for a vascular injury. If a patient has a stab wound just under the clavicle, I know the subclavian and the axillary vessels are there. So I'm going to assume that there's potential for injury in that area, and I'm going to image them appropriately. And, and that's why it's very important to keep, keep that in mind. So that C-spine has to stay, even if it makes, makes it uncomfortable for me as the operating surgeon. Thank you, um, doctors, for that very elaborate answer, which has put it into quite good context. Um, moving on to the next. In your opinion and past experience, this is a bit of a personal question. Is it possible to be a trauma surgeon and be a present father and husband? If no, why not? And if yes, how does one ensure that they are able to maintain such a task? So I, I can't comment about father and husband, but I can comment about mother and wife. <laughs> and I'm assuming that the, the question is really looking at, at personal life. So I, I really do believe that in whatever career you, you tend to choose, you can find a way to do the things that you need to do. Trauma surgery, architecture, law, whatever you choose to do well, is going to be challenging because when we seek personal mastery, um, we have to put a lot of time into the things that we do. What is very important in this situation is having a good support system. 
So it's not so much can I be a trauma surgeon and still be a mother and a wife, I am both. It's more a case of what is my support system like? And if you choose the right kind of partner and you uh, entail the, the assistance of a good grandmother or a good babysitter or people, you can find a way to do both. And, and I do think it's possible to be a present parent and still do these things. Yes, I've missed certain play dates and I've missed some school concerts and I've sometimes had to move birthday parties, but my children are happy and uh, our family is happy and I've still been able to have a very fulfilling career and still had a family on the side. And, and I would encourage you to realize that one of the things that you need to look at at the end of your career is not just what you achieve in your career, but what you have in your lives once your career is finished. And I promise you that there's never a day that goes by that I regret making the choice of becoming both a surgeon and a parent. And that's because my children give me something that brings me out of the medical mindset. And everybody needs that. Whether you become a parent or whether you have other interests, you must have something at home that allows you to withdraw from your job and recover from some of the things that you see. So yes, the answer is you can most definitely be a person with a family and still have a very good career. Thank you so much for emphasizing the importance of having a good support system. I'm sure we can all agree that that is really fundamental to having a fulfilling career and a happy family. And for also highlighting that you don't have to be one or the other, but you can be both um, in, in all instances, um, whether that is you wanting to have children or have a um, fulfilling married life or whatever that may be. So thank you so much. Moving on to the next question. So you have worked across both the private and public trauma surgery sector. How do these compare or differ clinically? Example, the frequent mechanism of injury and personally, example, the work hours and the lifestyle. So if, if we first look at the clinical aspect, um, what I've found personally is that it also depends where you're working. So the private sector, we often see a lot more blunt trauma than we see penetrating trauma. But I can also tell you from experience that where you work in the country makes a difference too. So when I was in Johannesburg, a lot of what I saw was more gunshots, um, stabs, uh, car accidents, motorbike accidents. When I moved down to the Cape, because of the kind of patients I manage, I manage a lot of fall from heights off the mountain. I have kite boarders coming in. I have people involved in adventure sports. I get lots of motorbikers that have gone into the Winelands and into the Karoo. Um, I've had para sailors coming off the mountain. So again, it depends on where you're working um, and the kind of patients that you see. Um, but definitely more blunt trauma than penetrating. That being said, I've also had a lot of penetrating cases that come to me in the private sector. And unfortunately, that's just the nature of the environment that we live in in South Africa. Um, from the standpoint of hours, I will tell you that it is far more difficult to work in the private sector because as a trauma surgeon in private, you actually don't have the support of interns, medical officers, registrars. You have to do everything yourself. There's also no point in which you are actually away. So when you work as a specialist in government, you have other specialists working with you. So when you are no longer on call, someone else is taking over the unit. And the same applies with medical officers and registrars. When you take on a patient in the private sector, that patient remains your patient 24-7 until they're discharged. So what I often have to do is that if I need a weekend off in the private sector, I have to ask a colleague to look after my patients for a day or two, um, just so that I can take a break. Because unfortunately, I don't have anyone that I'd hand over to while I'm working. So the upside to private work is that I also have access to a lot of things that we don't always have in government. That means I can get a radiologist whenever I want and I get the scans that I need done when I need them done. I can get hold of uh, an anaesthetist whenever I need one. I can generally get hold of an operating theater as soon as I require it. So there are very big differences between government and between private, but there are positives and negatives um, in both circumstances. <laughs> 
work hours, um, actually it was, it's easier working for, in the government. As, as hard as it is with the circumstances around it, my, my life was a lot easier when I was just working for the government and not working in the private sector. Thank you so much for shedding light on um, the differences of working in the private and public um, sector. I'm sure there's always this misconception that working in private is like glamorous and um, everything is so wonderful. So I'm so glad that you were able to tell us that it's not necessarily always the case um, mm -hmm. and that working in not glamorous at all. I put up my own drips. I put in my own central lines. I order my own x-rays. I don't have a registrar that I can say, can you just suture that laceration? Um, everything gets done by the surgeon themselves. So that is the, the one downside from that side. Definitely. So I think it's a very important decision to weigh the pros and cons um, when deciding which sector you want to work. But thankfully for doctor, you've worked in both. So you, I would say you've had the best of both worlds. Um, but yeah, moving on to the next question. So this is a bit of a similar question to one that we've had previously. The question states, how closely do you work with physiotherapists for rehabilitation of these patients? So again, we have different physios that do different things. We have uh, some physios that do more chest work. Um, and I get a lot of chest trauma. So my chest physiotherapists are very involved with my patients from the beginning. Um, and then I also have neurophysios that work with some of my more musculoskeletal or spinal cord injury patients. So we work very closely together and I get them involved from the beginning of the injury, even if the patients aren't ready for rehabilitation yet, because it's important for the patient to also feel that we're moving towards the end point of getting them as functional as possible as quickly as we can. And when we get the physios involved from the beginning, the physios are able to start with basic exercises to mobilize these patients, but that also gives the patient hope that they're going to move on from that point of injury. So it's extremely important to work closely with them. Thank you so much for that. Um, moving on to the last question. Uh, the question reads, um, in medical school, we are always reminded that medicine is largely learned by the bedside, especially in your field of work. Do you think that there are ways to prepare oneself before entering such a truly demanding environment, which at times can be very distressing in nature? What advice would you offer on how to cope and keep mentally sound with scenes that are particularly scarring, especially in trauma surgery? Look, I think that this boils down to anything that you choose as a career. Um, you have to have something outside of your job, whatever it is. Um, as a doctor, whether you choose to become a physician or whether you choose to be an oncologist or whether you choose to become any type of surgeon, there has to be something else in your life beyond medicine. It's important to go for excellence. It's important to master your skill. It's important to be dedicated. But at the same time, one day you will retire. One day you will stop operating. One day you will no longer practice. And you need to look at your life as a whole and decide what else do, do I want to grow me as a person? So it's important to have family. It's important to have other interests. You may be interested in music or art. You may like to do yoga. You might be a runner or a cyclist. It's important to have something else to turn to that is not just medicine um, to keep you well grounded uh, when those difficult times come along. And that it is truly because at the end of the day, as much as we love this job, it eventually will stop being a job. And you want to look back at your life and say you had a full life and that there were other interests that you entertained during that period. Um, most definitely. Thank you for highlighting the importance of being an individual in medicine and outside of medicine. Because as you say, it's really important to be um, like what they say, be a holistic, um, give holistic management to patients, but also look at a holistic management to your own life. Um, and that's the only way that will improve in our personal and professional development. So those are the pre-session um, questions. I just want to ask um, if anyone has a question, they're welcome to type it now um, in the chat um, box and then we can ask doctor. So I'll just give like 10, 15 seconds to see if there are any questions that anyone would like to ask. Okay, I see we have a hand up. Um, you are welcome to speak, um, Tandeka. Uh, 
Nandeka, um, is your hand up? You're welcome to speak. Okay, I'm not sure if that's a mistake. <laughs> yeah, sure. My hand is My up. Hand is I'm up. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Somehow. Somehow. My laptop managed to freeze on me, so that's what happened there. Um, but I just joined on my phone. So basically, what I did want to ask, because my the first question was my question, right? Um, so I just wanted to know, like, when did you know, basically, that you, I understand that you, like, gained your interest pre-med, and, you know, that was the stuff. But, like, when did you know, like, in the, your medical career, you know, because they always say, they always tell us, like, um, oh, you can't, like, just pinpoint yourself. You're bound to, like, change and, uh, and uh, you know, keep an open mind, all these weird things. So when did you know in your, like, medical career that, okay, actually, I'm a surgeon and not a physician? That's basically what I wanted to ask. I'm so sorry. Absolutely. So, so Tandeka, basically, I, I found in my second year already, that I, I, in fact, I knew in school already, I loved dissecting and I loved anatomy and I loved using my hands. And as much as I've always, so, so part of why I became a trauma surgeon was because I liked the critical care stuff that made my brain think, but I liked using my hands and operating. I really enjoyed the challenge of fixing the plumbing in the human body. So I loved fixing blood vessels and I loved putting bowel back together and I loved repairing the lung and all those beautiful steps that go with the surgical anatomy. And I think it was really when I was in my second year of medical school already that I knew that I wanted to do something where I would be physically fixing the human body. Um, as much as I enjoyed the academia of medicine, it used to frustrate me that it was the kind of thing where you gave someone something and then you waited to see if it worked. And if it didn't work, then you tried something else. What I liked about surgery was when there's a problem, you see the problem, you know the problem and you fix the problem. And, and so very early on in my, my career that I knew that I wanted to do surgery because I wanted to fix the problem straight away. I am a little bit, I'm an Aries and I'm impatient. And I like to get things done quickly and I like to do things in a way that I have control over them. And in surgery, you, you have to be in control. You have to see the problem, you have to understand the problem, and then you have to go and fix the problem. Um, from the surgical side, when I started doing surgery, my surgical training as a general surgeon, I knew that I wanted to do trauma because I had very good mentors. I, I was very privileged to be trained in the second oldest trauma unit in the world. Um, and it was started by Professor Ken Boffard, who is one of the main surgical people in trauma in the world, um, and by Jacques Huisson, who is another professor. And uh, I was very lucky that I had strong mentors that guided me in the direction of trauma surgery. And, and every time I did a rotation in my surgical career, I realized that trauma was the thing that I really loved. So for some people, you may not know in the beginning, and that's absolutely fine. The wonderful thing about medicine is that there are so many different careers. You've got our God bless our beautiful radiologists who like to hide in the dark and look at x-rays, and that's absolutely fine because we need them. Um, you've got those personalities, and then you've got the pathologists that uh, do their thing, and you've got our physician colleagues who can give us two million different facts at, at once. And then you've got the surgeons, which are a bit of like the plumbers in the uh, medical community. And, and the amazing thing about medicine is that there's a place for everybody. But you may find that the decision to become a surgeon or not will hinge on how much love you have for this. This is a very difficult career to go into. It demands a lot of you physically, emotionally, time-wise. If you love it, definitely pursue it. But you must love it if you want to pursue it because it will challenge you. I hope that answers your question. No, it, it was it was really answered um, in in depth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure.
Um, thank you, Dr. Bishop. Um, there's just one more question from Ms. Wilden, and her question is, hi, doctor. What is the process of specializing in trauma surgery in South Africa? Okay, so what you would do if you want to pursue trauma surgery is after you've done um, your community service, you then need to get a medical officer post in surgery. And the reason that you need to do that is before you can get a general surgical post, and you do have to do general surgery before you can do trauma surgery, you would have to have some surgical time. So the best thing that you could do is once you've finished your community services, find a medical officer post in an academic surgical posting. And then during that process, you will be able to start the period of studying and applying for a registrar's post in general surgery. You're then looking at five to six years, depending on the university of general surgical training. And once you complete general surgery, you then have the option to subspecialize in trauma surgery. And trauma surgery is a two-year subspeciality, which is basically similar to all subspecialities. If you do vascular, it's two years. If you do endocrine, if you do uh, hepatobiliary, these are all two-year fellowships. So you would have to do general surgery first and then subspecialize. Thank you so much. Um, so that concludes the talk, Safari in Tiger Country, an approach to blunt and penetrating injuries in the neck. Thank you, Dr. Bischoff, for sharing your valuable time and experience with us. The talk was exceptionally inspirational and Sundin and I find it to be an enriching opportunity to work with you. The recording of today's catch-up talk um, will be found at a later stage on our SAS YouTube channel. That's all from us, um, Azir Adanatka, Sangin Lee and Dr. Bischoff, um, uh, in terms of the SAS academic portfolio. Thank you everyone for joining today's catch-up talk. We hope to see you again next time. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.